Well, the clock has struck 1 p.m. here in Chicago, so we will get started with our conversation on the value of lifelong liberal education with Michael Roth, who is the president of Wesleyan University and an acclaimed intellectual historian. Uh, my name is Seth Green, and on an afternoon like this one, I'm especially grateful to say that I'm the dean here at the University of Chicago Graham School. And let me welcome you virtually to our gorgeous campus here in Hyde Park. It is actually a little snowy today, uh, so really putting a uh, crimp in our Halloween plans. Uh, I have two kids that both have short sleeve Halloween costumes, so we are uh, making amends at this moment. But uh, the picture does absolute justice to how beautiful it is on campus, even if with a little bit of white added. Uh, and for those who are not familiar with the Graham School, you should be. Uh, we are the home of lifelong learning, and we have been since the founding of this university, because when William Rainey Harper and John D. Rockefeller were imagining the university, they wanted to extend its intellectual assets across all ages and stages of life. And that mission was charged with the Graham School. And 130 years later, we remain the place to better understand the world and to live and examine life of purpose. And we do that across four program areas, a master of liberal arts that is the most rigorous and respected in the world, a basic program of liberal education for adults where you read great texts in a great environment, our open enrollment and winter registration is taking place right now. We have over 70 courses across all divisions of the university. And then we have partnerships that are constantly taking place with others who are involved in the mission of lifelong learning. But that is not why you are here today. You are here to hear from an intellectual historian who is also one of the trailblazers in higher education, Michael S. Roth. He became the 16th president of Wesleyan University in 2007, and he has overseen many exciting developments there, including the development of the Albritton Center for the Study of Public Life and the Shapiro Center for Writing. He's also overseen five interdisciplinary colleges, emphasizing research and cohort building in the areas of the environment, film, East Asian studies, integrative sciences, and design and engineering. Uh, but most relevant today, he is an intellectual historian. He's published many books on how people make sense of the past. And he has also, since joining Wesleyan, published three books bearing on liberal education, the most recent being The Student, A Short History. And I will add my spotlight here because we are going to be in conversation about that book. And I wanna start, Michael, by acknowledging that my excitement is that I followed your extraordinary leadership in higher education uh, and your case for liberal education. And when I saw your piece in the New York Times, I realized you had just written a new book on the student that goes from antiquity, which is very meaningful to us at the Graham School, to today. And I'm curious just to get our conversation started, if you could talk about what inspired you to write that book, especially in a time when technology, machine learning, AI, et cetera, is you know, changing learning yet again. Well, thank you, Seth. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you for everybody, to everybody for joining uh, today. Uh, I, I was inspired to write the book. Let's see. Maybe there's a there's a little bit of a back story. I, I wrote a, a book called Beyond the University, Why Liberal Education Matters, about 10 years ago now. Uh, I, I had been president for a while, and I had a bunch of old research that I published as a, as a book in my first couple of years. And then I was thinking, you know, I want to I don't want to just be a bureaucrat. I want I'm an intellectual historian. I teach every semester. I, I wanted to keep writing. So I thought writing a defense of liberal education, especially in the wake of the, the excitement about MOOCs and technology and online education and certificates and micro credentials to write a book about liberal education, uh, emphasizing how pragmatic it is, would be both an intervention uh, from my position as president of Wesleyan and um, as an intellectual historian, because I approach everything uh, historically, or at least chronologically. And so I wrote that book about American intellectual history, arguing that there's a tradition of liberal education in the United States that's quite different from liberal arts uh, traditions in Europe, not unrelated, 
but but much more uh, of an emphasis on the pragmatic value of liberal learning in the United States. And so I, I, I'm a European his, historian. I, my fo focus is usually on France. So I did this with great trepidation. Like I'd make some really stupid mistake and um, and uh, it went okay. <laughs> the book was well received for the most part. Um, and uh, after a, a, a second book called Safe Enough Spaces, which is more of a political book around free speech, criticizing the University of Chicago kind of thing <laughs> uh, for its absolutist views, a pragmatist view again about free speech and political correctness and, and uh, affirmative action. Uh, my editor at Yale said, I had this idea about doing a book about the student. And I think you're the guy to write it. And I said, well, if I write it, I'm gonna write a historical account. She said, yeah, and so why don't you make a proposal about, about what you, how you would do it to, to the press. And I've been teaching this course and I have a contract to write a book on virtue and vice in literature, history and philosophy. And the, that course starts with Confucius and ends with Daniel Allen, let's say <laughs> this year. Um, and so I thought, okay, if I do a book on, on the student, maybe I should start with like the iconic classical teachers you know, pre, before the modern age and even in, in the ancient world. So I decided to write about Confucius, uh, Socrates and Jesus in the beginning of the book as iconic teachers. And then with the notion that the, the last part of the book would be, um, what, how do we get from there, those kinds of learners with, uh, Confucius, Socrates, and Jesus to contemporary liberal learners, liberal arts students, if I could put it that way, uh, today in the United States. And uh, it was a lot of fun to write. I mean, I, I had to, to, to talk about being a perpetual student. I had to learn a lot. I called my colleagues, you know, and I have a chapter on the medieval period. I called the, my friends who teach medieval history. They were appalled that I would try to do this. You know, <laughs> and and uh, and try to sketch out a book over about it took about five years because I I don't have much time to write except in the summer, and so um, I, uh, it took a while. It's a short book, and uh, uh, but it did allow me to make the argument about what's most important in the modern idea of the student and how that grows out of these older traditions. Well, let's start into those older traditions, and then we'll walk ourselves forward, uh, including through the medieval period that you got counsel on. But coming back to the, you know, origin students in the book, um, the followers of Confucius, the interlocutors of Socrates and the disciples of Jesus, um, talk about how those represent different models of the student and um, you know, if you can maybe begin to foreshadow any elements in there that, you know, we can kind of bring through even to today. Sure. So um, I, I, in, a, in a word of the followers of Confucius, they're trying to follow a path. Um, and and Confucius uh, is, is clearly not providing them with a doctrine so much as a mode of moving through life. And the, I look at three of his students who represent very different ways of being a student, a very pious and, and, and uh, uh, attentive uh, 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 student, a brash and courageous one, et cetera. And, 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 and so that following a path for the Confucius model, um, the Socrates model is the model of the critical thinker. So important, of course, today, right? Um, the follow a path model works a lot too with apprentices and um, uh, people today who want to, to instruct students in specific uh, activities. But with Socrates and his interlocutors, it's really about exposing the ignorance of others as a vehicle for learning about what you need to learn yourself. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's an extraordinarily powerful notion in the West. Uh, I've written in this book and elsewhere that I think it's rather limited that some of my colleagues uh, think that they're, they're, it's it's the top of the educational pyramid to equip students to be skeptical and to tear everything apart. I actually think it's kind of more in the middle, that it's like a more of an adolescent version of education and that a more mature version of education also allows you to um, devote yourself to something. 
and not just criticize something. We can come back to that. So I look at three different uh, uh, student types that Socrates worked with um, uh, as critical thinkers. And then in the case of Jesus' apostles, I look at three again, uh, the imitation of a life so that you can transform your own. That uh, this notion of a, a, a imitation uh, as a vehicle of transformation. And, and we see that we see that today, as you can see it in arts education, sometimes even in liberal education, alas, that uh, some very charismatic professors um, uh, create, uh, sometimes they're called cults, I guess. Uh, the uh, University of Chicago is rather famous for generating some of these actually, where the professor has a big personality and is, and, and I mean, the, the, the cheap version of this, right, is like the professor's a pipe smoker, so everybody smokes their pipe, you know, and it tries to imitate that way of, of interacting with the world. In the case uh, I look at it with the Jesus Apostle, it's a devotion to a mode of life that transforms your own. Yeah. Yes, and we're uh, proud of some of the uh, iconic individuals that come out of this university, though I doubt any of them would compare themselves to the uh, origin case that you're uh, you're referencing. <laughs> yeah. I'll leave that go for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I doubt any of us would compare them. Maybe right. it's good enough. <laughs> themselves. Um, well, so uh, I want to take a big jump. Uh, so if that's the origin, uh, let's come into medieval Europe, uh, which is the next kind of stage that you really look deeply at in the book. And of course, this is very meaningful to us in higher education. This is a time when the European universities uh, begin, you know, thinking Oxford, Cambridge, but also uh, those in other parts. Uh, and I'm curious what the student looks like in this period of time. So um, I, I, have, I have to give the caveat, right? Because one of my colleagues I called when he was a, the one who was appalled and couldn't help me at all. Um, Sorry about that. It's okay. It, it was too, too big a subject. Um, uh, it is a very big subject. And of course, what's happening in the Iberian Peninsula uh, um, in 1200 is very different from what's happening in but it's now Bulgaria, let's say, in, in 300 or something like, you know, of course, I'm painting with a spray can. And, um, and, and, but the notion is that in this period, for many people, being a student means learning to create your own household, learning to become independent of your originary family, your original, original household, and to uh, integrate into a community. So there are two things, right? Independence and integration. Uh, not everybody gets this in school. In fact, almost very, very few people get that in school. You get it um, uh, in your own family. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you, and, and in some cases you get it through a, a church. And, and, and later in the middle medieval period in some countries, you, you begin to get it in schools and then the birth of the university. But they're always about economic independence and cultural or social integration. And so the successful student is the one who's able to go off on their own, but also integrate it into the community. And so if we take that as what's developing in the medieval period, um, the big moment, even though I know it plays out over hundreds of years, where we begin to kind of peer into the student today is the Enlightenment. And I'm curious if you could talk about what's happening in the Enlightenment. And the part of your book that I found particularly fascinating and very relevant to our work at the Graham School, because we read Kant in a lot of yes. uh, our different courses, is the vision that Immanuel Kant had for Enlightenment. And I'm curious if you could talk about that vision and even how it influences our understanding to this day of the role of the student. Because it seemed like when I was reading your book, that was a very influential moment in terms of bringing us to how we conceive of the student in our present day. Absolutely, absolutely. Kant is the pivotal figure really, uh, but I'm gonna take one step, little tiny step back yeah. because it, in the pre-modern discussion, I also talk about apprenticeships as this vehicle, kind of an institutionalized vehicle for achieving independence. You know, you learn a trade and you can take the freedom and, um, and uh, integration you become part of a guild, let's say, in, in a town. And so I, I, I was very interested in unusual apprenticeships, as you know from the book, uh, one with uh, women apprentice, apprentices in London, uh, which one of my colleagues pointed me to the research on. And 
Um, uh, cause most, most, when I was imagining apprentices, I was imagining boys, you know, and, um, and so I, I write about women apprentices and how they became independent and integrated. And then I write about these two failed apprenticeships, which are enlightenment apprenticeships. One is a uh, Ben Franklin, the other is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And, um, and they fail because Franklin and Rousseau wanted more than economic independence. Mm. They wanted more than integration in society. They wanted freedom. Yeah. And Franklin, you know, he just couldn't, as he said, Ben Franklin, of course, he's so funny. He says something like, my brother, my master, who was his brother, he beat me more than was necessary, you know. <laughs> and, and, and Rousseau, it talks about as an, what he learned as an apprentice was to steal, to lie, to cheat, because he hated his master so much. Not because, not because he didn't want to become a, a, an, a, an engraver, right. yeah. but because the guy was a tyrant. So in both for, for Ben Franklin and for Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, it, it's freedom that they're denied as they're learning. Yeah. Go to Kant. Kant says, and what is enlightenment? That enlightenment is freedom from self-imposed immaturity, right? And, and so freedom is getting rid of our immature ways, of the ways in which we follow things just because an authority figure told us to, a parent, a family, a tradition. And so being a student, being in the course of enlightenment means from Kant, and I think throughout the modern and contemporary world, learning to be free. Yeah. What does it mean to learn to no longer be a child? And, yeah. and it's so curious because if you're in school, you have a teacher there. So you're kind of infantilized in some way, or at least you're, you're there's a hierarchy in, in a classroom. I don't believe in the the fancy, you know, the teachers who say, well, just, I'm just another student. No, uh, teachers are teachers, I, I think. But the paradox is the teacher, the great teachers teach you how to be, teach you how to practice freedom. And that means leaving behind your, your immaturity. Uh, and, and it's never complete. That's why it's perpetual, right? That's why we always go back to school. That's why I still teach so I can actually continue to learn. Uh, and but it's more than economic independence. It's more than getting along with your fellows. It's thinking for yourself in the company of others. Hmm. And that's I think that's really from Kant. I think Rousseau agrees it's largely. And then from there, I trace this how this idea plays out institutionally in higher education. And before we jump into that, yeah. I just want to come back earlier. You know, you put Socrates here in the middle kind of saying, yeah, critical thinking is good, but just breaking things down isn't enough. For you, when you're kind of ordering of what aspirational learning looks like, is it fair to say Kant's vision of, you know, learning as a way of becoming free? Is that, I'm curious when you mentioned that earlier, what you put up at the top, and I didn't know, having read your book, if, if Kant is the vision that, you know, gets you upward in that, uh, that paradigm. I, I think that formulation of Kant's is is uh, is 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 all, almost perfect. Huh. I, 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 my hesitation is because there are a lot of things that Kant says that I would not want to have to subscribe to. Um, you know, as a as a as a pragmatist, Kant had a lot of uh, things that I to, that, that I find right. uncongenial and and. Uh, he had a he had a, you know a metaphysics and a, 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 and a commitment to certain hierarchies that I don't think one needs to maintain, but in this regard, Kant stands for the for the Enlightenment, and 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 the the Enlightenment's commitment to how helping people engage in learning how to be free. And not be just alone, you know, not just be isolated, right. but learning to think for yourself in the company of others. Well, so I want to go into, and your book does this as well, um, the many people who are not free in the very time that, you know, Kant is writing. And uh, the reality that learning in the context of slaves or others cannot set them free because of the constructs of society. And so you've noted uh, in your book um, that, you know, this concept uh, is really shaped by W.E.B. Du Bois. 
And I'm curious if you could talk about his approach to education and how the notion of student changes during his own lifetime, because that's a moment where, yeah. you know, this concept um, begins to become more real for more people. Yeah. So again, I'll take a, a slight step backward and, as, as, a, as a way of getting to Du Bois, which is that I, I spend some time on the, I, the, 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 the other side of the Enlightenment discourse, which is that um, the claim that Kant made and many others made around him, there are some people who can't be students, a priori, right. slaves, African slaves in particular. They can't be students because they can't graduate. Because if they could graduate, if they could actually learn to be free, you couldn't keep them. It couldn't have enslaved them to begin with. It would have been immoral to enslave them. And so Kant and, and a host of others in the French Enlightenment um, justify the slavery of Black people um, uh, by saying they could never learn to be uh, to leave behind their immaturity. And they come up with all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, theories about why that's the case. Um, but, but and, and I think it's instructive to, to, for, for understanding why being a student is linked to freedom to look at the people who are denied studenthood or who denied the status of being a student. And of course it's slaves. And so there are laws passed against teaching slaves to read. Uh, all these kind of crazy hypocritical things that, that are meant to justify racist institutions from which people reap enormous profits. Um, that, and those questions, of course, continue to haunt us today. And, and so those are in the, already in the late 1700s. My, my friend here at Western, Andrew Curran, uh, has been working on a book called The Race Makers. And he and Skip Gates published this book called Who's Black and Why? <laughs> um, about these various theories of what, what blackness meant in the 1700s. Um, so I've used some of their research uh, to, uh, to talk about these things. And then Du Bois comes of age in the, you know, the late 18, 1800s. And, and he, you know, he, as a kid, he's in, he's in this tiny town of Great Barrington, Massachusetts. I live right adjacent to there when I'm not on campus, actually. Um, it's still a tiny town. <laughs> Um, and and he was one of the only black people around, um, and he was a gifted kid. I mean, the kid, the town took up a collection and said we had to send him to a place where he can be have a, a better schooling uh, with other black people. And so he he's sent down south, um, and 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 he goes to an all black institution, and and if, he does extraordinarily well. He thrives there. He edits the paper. He's a he's a he's a he's a man about town. He, 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 he does, he does work as a teacher, uh, uh, and, and, and then really experiences, uh, the, the, the sharp edge of racism because he encounters more white people there who, um, uh, are hell bent on denying black people any access to uh, the benefits of living in society. Uh, he graduates and then goes off to Harvard and at Harvard, he both sees that racism is a, 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 so powerful as to make kind of a normal social life impossible for him, and that education is an incredible resource at his fingertips. So it's this this dual um, uh, uh, experience. You know, he, Harvard's you know the, it's not like Chicago. They're not you know Harvard's about social life and clubs and stuff like that, right? You know, they, they, they're eating clubs and this and that. And, 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 um, and he can't access any of that stuff. Uh, but he can access William James. And he can access Santayana. And he can uh, access other great figures in social science at the time at Harvard who do give him a great education. And, and he's soaking it all in, soaking in the racism, rejecting it and soaking in this incredible education in social theory and philosophy. And then he comes upon an advertisement for um, a scholarship uh, for the, the, uh, the black people in the United States who want to further themselves through education. And he applies for the scholarship and he, he denied the scholarship because they said something like this, this is for people who want to further themselves. You just want a liberal arts education. That doesn't count. And he's a, you know, he's, all they want are, are black plumbers and black uh, blacksmiths and black uh, uh, artisans of all kinds, like the Booker T. Washington approach. 
he's he wants to go study in Germany. He wants to go study sociology <laughs> with the best people in the world. He gets the scholarship. He goes to Germany, and um, and he soaks in there what an atmosphere that's that he does not experience as racist in the way America was. Black white stuff doesn't matter as much. He's he's taken into with white families. A, a white woman proposes marriage to him in Germany, you know, and and so he rounds out his education. He deepens it in sociology, and he sets himself up for a path of lifelong learning through research, teaching, and political organizing. So Du Bois is a kind of hero who overcame. Uh, extraordinary obstacles put in by a racist society uh, to to develop his own body of thinking to to practice freedom. Not that I agree with all his you know positions. Who cares? Uh, but but that he actually found a way to remain a student for a very long time and and practice this this enlightenment process of leaving behind uh, uh, immaturity. It's a long answer to your question, sorry. <laughs> a, a, a wonderful answer. And, and I want to ask a couple of questions, but then I'm going to turn it over to the audience. So let me just uh, prime them to send in your questions to the chat, and we'll get to them momentarily. Uh, Michael, we've now gone from antiquity uh, nearly to today. And I'm curious if you could just talk across time and space as you then look across all of these examples. What do you see as the common aspects of the student? Like, how would you describe what the cohesive line across all of those different moments in time and types of learners? So, um, I, 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 I guess I have to say, I don't think there is an essence like that. Um, and maybe that's because I'm an intellectual historian. And, you know, one of my teachers was, uh, uh, was Michel Foucault. And, and so, I mean, I'm in a way I'm I'm doing a genealogy of this contemporary idea of, of student. That you, the contemporary idea is you practice freedom. I think that's the most important element of being a student today. Yeah. And so then I I trace go backwards, you know, and 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 how did that idea emerge from some very different notions of being a student? And at, so that's the research. I go backwards, and then I think Collingwood said this. Then you write forward. You write from the you know from the old to the new. Uh, I, I think these these things really do change, and the practices of freedom change. I write about this in the book that for a lot of people, like in colleges, not the University of Chicago, you know, which is famous for not wanting anyone to have a good time for a long time, <laughs> right? It's changed. I know we are but, the place where fun came to die. Where that's we're right. Reinventing ourselves is rigorous and fun, but right, uh, right. So you that guys is our history. Shifted. So, but but you know, I look at this. In America, people who went to college up until the Second World War, almost, um, they really, they idea of being free was to get drunk. Their idea of being free was to like be able to shoot guns off in the dorm. And, and there was all this discourse about like by administrators from Thomas Jefferson at the University of Virginia to people at Harvard and, and, and Wesleyan <laughs> into the early 1900s, just despairing that they, what the students really wanted to do was to buck authority. But of course, that's a very immature way of practicing freedom. It's right. just trying to show you're not the boss of me kind of freedom. Um, and then, and women have a very different relationship to that authority over time. And I try to talk about how women's colleges evolve there. And what really happens in the United States in higher education, and in part, it's thanks to the, the opening up of educational institutions to new classes of people, immigrants in particular, and then other racial groups uh, uh, later on. What really happens is American higher education is that instead of just practicing this adolescent notion that you're not the boss of me, students begin to try to develop their own consciousness in relation to a teacher's, but standing on their own feet, thinking for themselves. And, 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 and this happens famously in the 1960s, uh, uh, in, across the United States, um, not just a rebellion uh, against authority, but an attempt to articulate what practicing freedom would look like. And I find that very powerful. I spent some time on those 60s radicals. And, but I also think that someone like Alan Bloom, who was appalled by those folks at, when he was at Cornell and then you know, came to Chicago as a refuge from them in some ways, 
But even Alan Bloom's complaints about students later on in the 80s, those were complaints that students didn't care about freedom anymore. They only right. cared about getting uh, internships or jobs or something. And, and, and so um, both conservatives and radicals want students to do more than just get economic independence, more than just integrate to the status quo, that they want them to learn to think for themselves and to be able to participate in a community. And I do think, I guess, if, if pushed against the wall, like what, the, what's the, the core idea of the, the student for me today? That's it, you know, that, that you're committed to practicing freedom, which means you, you've got to keep trying, right? I mean, you're, you're, ne you're never done. You're never fully enlightened, as Khan always said. You just have to keep at it, keep learning, um, and keep talking to people who might have ideas different from your own. Because that, you know, when you wind up, we have this problem in colleges and universities today, people tend to flock to others who think like them, but then your chances of discovering something new are much reduced. So I think that in the company of others is really important so that you have a chance to learn from someone whose views are very different from your own. Well, so we are getting a lot of questions, Michael, and a lot of them are, how does your book apply to the world when I look at them? And a lot of them relate to your simultaneous role alongside being an intellectual historian as president of a liberal arts college. And so first one here is from Maureen and Steve, and they ask, what is the argument for American parents to pay for a liberal college education given a world driven by tech engineering medicine? And so I mean, the classic question, I'm sure this is not the first time you've answered this as president of Wesleyan, but how do you think about the value of a liberal education in a world where we prize uh, science, engineering, uh, tech? Um, I realize those are not incompatible, but, you know, one yeah, of your sure. for how those align. I, I, I think that the, um, that the, the emphasis on uh, on technical fields is um, made liberal education even even more important than it than had been before, uh, in the sense that uh, we need people uh, who are capable of putting technical achievements and um, scientific research in ethical, political, historical contexts, and to articulate what's at stake in relation to uh, what what looks what might look like progress at times. Um, and other times might look like uh, uh, a disaster scenario. Uh, I, it, it's also, I think, very important to know that um, many of the technical fields that looked like they were going to be burgeoning just a few years ago will soon be dis disappear because of artificial intelligence. I mean, we don't, we don't need people to do those things anymore. Machines can do them. What can't a machine do? It can't think for you. It, it, now, I, I tell this to my students, and some of them like roll their eyes because they say, well, yes, it can. <laughs> I could ask the, the machine to think for me. And, and it's true, the machine thinks. But if one abdicates one's capacity to think for oneself and to listen to others, uh, then I think you're giving up really your humanity. So I, I think a liberal education today puts one in a position to... Um, make a thoughtful contribution to a variety of kinds of organizations uh, to our society and to participate as citizens. Now, I, you're talking to a president who just started a college of design and engineering at a liberal arts college. You can imagine that many of my colleagues were not enthusiastic on the faculty. I do believe that design and engineering are absolutely vital. I mean, we taught it, those things, we taught engineering at the art school I, I was the president of in San Francisco. Um, so there, it's absolutely key to, to have engineers who can make things that work really well. And it's absolutely key to have engineers who know how to integrate those things that work really well into society, into politics, uh, into culture. And um, I think a liberal education still provides students with those tools for thinking for themselves and making contribution to the world around them. We have another question that's related in my mind. So I'm going to ask that next and then I'll come to other questions in the chat. It's from John McNaneman. And it's, do you see the number of American students trying to go to college as excessive given the fact that only half 
finish. And I think it may be 60%, but a large number who don't make it all the way through. Um, he goes on to write, it seems that in Europe, the system is more in line with society's needs and that uh, there are relatively early ages, students are steered into trade or academic education. And I'll just raise for you, Michael, I'm sure you saw Paul Tuff's, uh piece uh, in the New York Times Magazine over the summer, you know, about uh, in, you know, your lifetime when you were going to school, it was a clear, you know, um, almost entirely definitive ROI. And at least the case of that article is today uh, more of a gamble. I'm curious just how you think about and respond uh, who should be going and how to ensure that college remains, you know, a value for the vast majority of people who, who attend it. So I, I think that um, uh, it is certainly the case that uh, the creation of pathways to college, uh, especially for-profit colleges and universities uh, in, let's say, from 95 to 2015 or 2010, that this pathway uh, um, was, was littered with predatory lenders who um, encouraged people to use someone else's money to pursue a degree that they were not qualified to complete, or at least would not complete, and saddle you know millions of Americans with excessive debt, uh, and I, I think you know that I think was uh, uh, disastrous for many for many people. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I am loath to commit to a practice that would reinforce the social hierarchies. Uh, of our country where only some people would get the benefits of college education. And those people are likely to be the wealthiest people in the country right now. Their children will go to college. I've never met, um, or I've rarely met uh, um, a, a, a wealthy parent who has who thinks their their kid should could do should do something else than college. The question is, um, do people of modest means, do they still see college as a vehicle for social mobility? And I think the, the answer is, is now mixed, as, as that article argued, it's more of a bet. But but that's partly because public institutions are so underfunded. And, and it's partly because the preparation of high school students in this country is plagued by the inequalities that uh, plague the society more generally. In other words, if you're a poor kid in this country, you're, you're very likely to go to a crappy high school. And if you're a rich kid, you're very likely to go to a great high school. Who's going to want to go to college? I mean, it, and so you say, well, the kid who goes to a bad high school, they should become plumbers. I, I don't, I don't, I don't see that. Um, I, I, I would rather make those schools better, so that everybody has a chance to have more education. I, no one has ever argued, I don't think, around the world, that Americans are too educated. I mean, our educational system leaves people without the ability to read when they graduate high school. So should those people go to college? No, they should have a better high school, but they don't. So some community colleges teach them how to read or teach them how to get a trade. I do think um, uh, the tendency to say, okay, we, we, not everybody should go to college, uh, smacks of a tendency that not everybody deserves to have a good life. Some people are not gonna have a very good life. So they can, we just don't wanna have them have expectations too high. And, and that sounds a little harsh, and maybe it is a little harsh, but I really do think, given the deficit of civic understanding in this country, given the deficit of reading and abilities and basic quantitative skills, less education for American citizens is not the answer. But it sounds like you would be for trying to do more to deal with what you might call predatory universities that um, have you know, a high likelihood of being underwater for, for the student. Yeah, I mean, it does, when you disaggregated those statistics some time ago, you saw that a significant uh, percentage, much more than the proportion would warrant of, of those loans were going to were at schools that would basically, it was the unregulated market, what you guys in Chicago love so much, the unregulated market, predatory lenders, it was a classic scam. And now they say, well, people shouldn't go to college. No, you shouldn't allow people to have predatory loans for college. Right. You should regulate colleges and universities. So you don't have something like a Trump university 
um, or, or some of the other schools that really have mostly disappeared or been eaten up by other schools now and hide their balance sheet. Um, but, but those, I think, you know, did a great disservice to, Amer to Americans. It's true, I realize that some people would be really happy with an artisanal job and they should get respected for that job. I, 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 I do respect those people, but I think giving them a good education, whether it's, you know, the 13th year of education or it's a college or community college, that I think is a secondary question, but Americans are not overeducated. And to, to reduce educational opportunity in this country is, uh, I think, a bad idea. Uh, Joy asks, you mentioned learning to think for yourself while in the company of others. Do you feel today's educational institutions from K to 12 schools to universities are failing in finding this balance? If so, what are you doing at Wesleyan and feel others might do to better achieve being able to think independently while not undercutting anyone else's right to think independently? Yeah, it's great. Such a great question. Thank you so much. I mean, this is my project for the last, I don't know, 12 years or so as president of Wesleyan. I've been beating on the drum of, of not just liberal education, but of, of being more aware uh, in, in the academy of our biases and, and, and many of those biases involve uh, biases against conservatives or against uh, people of faith. And, um, and so I, I think in the Wall Street Journal many years ago now, I, I wrote a piece calling for an affirmative action program for conservatives at elite colleges and universities. And you know everybody was angry at me uh, about that conservative. So we don't need affirmative action. We're, we just need merit. And the, the progressives like you sullied the words affirmative action by putting them near the word conservative. But the point, my point was, and and I still try to make this at Wesleyan that we 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 need to value intellectual diversity. And it, when I was a student here at Wesleyan, that you know political diversity meant you had a Trotskyite and and a Leninist in the same dorm. You know, it's like it was. And, and I, I didn't even, and of course, I didn't notice. I was one of those people. Um, and and uh, I don't know, 12 years ago, uh, I, I recruited a trustee to uh, here who's an alum, who's on the board of Cato. And, you know, he was a strong libertarian, brilliant guy. And he kept pointing out to me all the ways in which I made these assumptions that were just biases. And I don't agree with him about politics. He doesn't, you know, that's fine. We talk all the time. But, but I did see these biases and I, I talk about it with my faculty members. I think it's up to them to correct for them. Uh, I think it's up for the, the students should be empowered to point them out. Um, I, I do think it's possible for people to listen to each other even in very intense and stressful times, but it's easier not to. It's easier to filter your group. So you only talk to people who think like you, whether it's your sports team or your religious group or it's your you know your uh, social media followers it's easier to have an echo chamber but college and universities should you know we should make people work hard build the muscles of listening and considering other points of view i i think many schools do it i don't think we do it enough it's in the humanities and social sciences um and and um i think it's really important to keep encouraging our students to consider things that they find offensive, that they find troubling, that they find eye-opening, and then uh, let them determine for themselves uh, which of those things are gonna be good to think with after they graduate. Well, so we are out of time, my fellow, oh, sorry. Uh, but I do wanna ask one closing sure. question, and it's a big one, uh, but I know you've thought about it. Um, as you said, you know, as a leader in higher education and as someone who as a historian has studied, you know, the student and these values across time and space, what do you see as you look to the future as the biggest challenge and opportunity for a liberal education? Like, where do you see concern? Wh which trend, and there are probably many that are putting it at risk, and then where do you see the greatest opportunity? What, what's the bright spot that you know, we should all be thinking, how do we, if we care about lifelong liberal education, focused on making sure we, you know, continue this tradition? Yeah, thank you. I, I think the, 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 the great hurdle is, is inequality. You know, I would hate for pragmatic liberal education, which is this great American thing. It's open to anybody. 
You know, I mean, Dewey made this clear. It's open end, but you, you don't have to be studying classics, right? You could be, you can be, you could be studying engineering, but you could do it within the fabric of a or in the context of a liberal education. But but if liberal education becomes the preserve of the wealthy, with a couple of you know specimens of poor people who trotted in to make wealthy people feel less guilty, that's 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 really a a, a, a terrible thing. And that means that public institutions have to encourage the study of a broad range of disciplines. And it, and it means that great private institutions like Chicago, like Wesley and like the Ivies to continue to, to select students who want a broad education. I mean, it's appalling to see the numbers of people who major in the humanities at Harvard or Stanford. I don't, I'm not familiar with the numbers in Chicago. Um, and 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 they and they select for that. I mean, people blame it on the professors. They blame it on the discoursers. Right? But the schools select for that. They select people who want to get rich fast. And majoring in English is not the vehicle for that. They could select differently. So I I think that um, um, inequality um, and um, the um, the drift away from humanities and interpretive social sciences are real hurdles for us. The opportunity is what you all are doing. The opportunity is that liberal education doesn't have to be just for people between 18 and 22. Uh, we have a GLS, a graduate liberal studies program here at Wesleyan as well. And, and, and I, I, I work with students of different ages, but not enough. I do think it's really important that we cultivate practices of learning that are not uh, uh, segregated to uh, job preparation years or you know just keep becoming adult years and that there are, there are vehicles for I think the Stanford Design School calls looping back into education um, where people can can consider big questions of politics and ethics of the sciences um, uh, and, and of, of, of culture of art um, together so that they can think for themselves in good company and good company doesn't have to mean Adolescence. <laughs> Good company could be um, the kind of people you bring to uh, your programs. Well, Michael, it is a joy to have you with us and to have your brilliance in our virtual room. Um, I'll just close by saying that the motto of our university is let knowledge grow from more to more and so be human life enriched. And we at Graham are very proud to be the home of learning for life enrichment, where people come uh, because they want to better understand the world and live an examined life of purpose. And of course, there are ways in which they can apply those critical thinking skills and writing and reading to their work. But uh, we're proud to carry on that tradition that, you know, moral character matters and is ultimately one of the things that liberal education can provide better than any other. So uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for your book. And thank you for your leadership in higher education. And uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Thank you so much. It's really a, a privilege to be with you today. Thank you. Bye, everyone.